Hear now the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Uh, This may surprise some of you, um, but I actually had a a fairly decorated athletic career uh, when I was much younger. Um, I don't mean to say that I won those competitions. I received a lot of participation ribbons and trophies. Those were the decorations that I received, and I received many of them. I won nothing, uh, but I was well decorated for all of my efforts. Um, Participation trophies and ribbons are something that have come under criticism, Um, If you want to know the poster child for why they created those, I am he. I am the one they were thinking of when they imagined people who would need something uh, for participating in these kinds of things. And a lot of people have reflected on the introduction of them as I was in the era when I was growing up um, as potentially playing a role in millennials um, like me, and I'll throw myself under the bus if this isn't you and you're millennial. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. Um, for being overinflated, for being underachieving in certain areas. And I think um, certainly some of those participation ribbons felt better. It was nice to win that, I can still remember that that pink sixth place trophy in the race, or or, or ribbon in the race. Um, I was the sixth runner. There was only six of us, uh, but I did win sixth that day. I can remember it uh, from my childhood. And Again, I, I think that's a part of uh, where we think about um, people getting these participation trophies. Uh, Jean Twenge has talked about my generation. Uh, she's a psychologist, a sociologist who studies uh, generations and generational differences, how you know the baby boomers differ from Gen X, which differ from millennials, which differ from Gen Z, and on and on and on. Really great um, resources and books that she has written. They've helped me a lot in thinking about different people and how they relate to the world and think about things. I don't know whether she's a Christian or not, uh, but she is interviewed by a lot of different Christians on their podcasts and things talking about um, how different people relate to the world. Well, a a book that helped me understand my generation um, was entitled by her called Generation Me, Why Today's Young Americans Are More Confident, Assertive, Entitled, and More Miserable Than Any Ever Before. And the idea there is that, that through these participation ribbons and trophies, it was really kind of a harmful thing. It enabled and encouraged, in a lot of cases, mediocrity and underachievement, uh, because the real world doesn't give participation ribbons or trophies. It can be some, somewhat of a brutal awakening when you go out into the real world and, and realize that, that you can't count on bringing home some of these decorations um, that a terrible athlete like I was able to gain. But then we come to a story like what we have from Jesus here. And here we have not just participation. I mean, I mean, for me, the, the participation trophies I got, it wasn't like all of us got first place ribbons. You know, I got the, sort of the last place, but there was a ribbon for the last place. We're reading here about even the last workers who work just one hour are given a full day's wages, a denarius. And we look at this and ask the question, is this right? 
Is this good? Is this fair? Is this just? What are you actually telling us, Jesus? We just don't like the idea that the first and the best of us shouldn't get preferential treatment in the kingdom over those who are last and worst. But when I phrase it so starkly, some of the thoughts that just sort of naturally bubble up in our heart are sort of revealed for what they are. Then when we think about God and the kingdom of heaven, we all fall so far short of the glory of God because of our sin that that none of us have any claims to being the first. If any of us are going to get in, much less to excel, if that's even in view here, then it's going to require not our efforts, not our achievements and accomplishments, something we do for God. It's going to require the utter grace and favor and kindness of God toward all of us who are all last. So as we think about this question of who deserves what in God's kingdom and how God's generosity factors in all that, The big idea here, and this is the point that Jesus himself makes of this parable to explain it and to interpret us, that comes in the last verse, verse 16. The big idea is this. Jesus makes the last first. It's not about what we deserve. It's about great grace that Jesus makes the last first. So three parts to our sermon today. First of all, calling um, in verses 1 through 7. Second, compensating in verses 8 through 12. And third, casting away, casting away in verses 13 through 16, calling, compensating, and casting away. Now, in this first section, we read about the call of all of these laborers in verses 1 through 7, so calling. In verse 1, Jesus transitions into this section with the little word for, little connection word for, for the kingdom of heaven is like. Now, when, when Jesus uses this word for, it's like he's telling us, or whenever we read this in the New Testament, it's, it's, it's like we're reading, okay, let me tell you what I just meant, what I just said. Let me interpret that. Let me give you more information to understand what I had just said. So we have to actually look at the page and see what Jesus had just said. In the previous verse, notice what Jesus says there, but many who are first will be last and the last first. Well, notice Jesus says something very similar at the end of our passage in verse 16. But notice that the order is switched. This is really important. In 16, it's, so the last will be first. That's what's emphasized in this particular parable. And the first last. We do see how the first are made last. But the real emphasis is on how the last will be made first. Now, why does Jesus need to underscore that particular message? Well, this also gets at something that happened in the previous passage. In verse 27, it was the question of Peter. Remember, Peter said, we've given up everything to follow you. What then will we do? have. Think of all the sacrifices we have made. We are the first to follow you, and we have given up the most. What will we have out of this arrangement, Jesus? And Jesus told them the great promises. You will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Everyone who has left houses and brothers and fathers and sisters or mother or children or lands for my sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit the eternal life, inherit eternal life but many who are first will be last. And that's a reminder of what came a little bit earlier, the rich young man who was sent away and the last first. And here's where Jesus transitions into this new parable in chapter 24. Let me explain to you how you should be thinking about these things. Let me explain to you what I just meant, Jesus is saying. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When we think about these, the, the vineyard here, it's important to understand that the whole Bible says, uses the idea of a vineyard as a symbol for God's people. This is used several times for the people of Israel in the Old Testament. For example, if you want a particular passage, Isaiah 5, verses 1 through 7, talks about Israel as a vineyard of God. And it shows up in a no, number of other places as well. Jesus, in John chapter 15, verse 1, says to his disciples, He says, I am the true vine, and you are the branches. So the vineyard are the disciples themselves. In the New Testament later, we read that the church is a vineyard. You are God's field, God's vineyard, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. So the vineyard always refers to God's people. We're talking about working among God's people. And who's working among God's people? 
It's these laborers, those who serve God by serving others. That's our mission statement, you may remember. We make disciples who worship and serve, who worship God and serve God, but especially serving God by serving other people. Now, there's a particular view probably in, this, in the symbolism since Jesus was talking to his disciples, those who would be the first ministers in his kingdom. Jesus probably has a particular idea in mind of the officers of the church, the pastors, the elders, the deacons of the church, but also other leaders. And, and really, if you start thinking about this, who all is called to serve people, the people of God? It's really all of us in one way or another. All of us are given gifts so that you, we can use these gifts to serve the fellow needs that we have in the body of Christ. And this master of a house, clearly representing Jesus, goes out into the field, or goes out into hire laborers to send out into his field. And notice in verse 2 what happens. Now these first laborers, they're never called the first laborers, except just sort of vaguely, but here we don't read them called the first laborers because we don't know that other laborers are coming next. But we read that he goes out to hire laborers, and these are the first laborers, and notice what they do. They strike an agreement. They get a contract. They know exactly how much they are going to make from this one day of work. We can almost hear the echo of Peter's words, what are we going to get for this, Jesus? We're leaving everything. What are we going to get out of this arrangement? And here the master of the house agrees um, for them to be paid a denarius a day. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, that a denarius was a, a standard wage for a work day, he sent them out into his vineyard. Now, the master is not done. There are not enough laborers working in his vineyard. And so he goes out at the third hour. Now, the third hour is still pretty early in the morning. Uh, the, 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 the counting of the hours started at 6 a.m., so the third hour is 9 a.m. And then again, he goes out at the sixth hour at 12 p.m., and the ninth hour at 3 p.m. Now, we read among the, first, this, uh, the second group of this, first set of, or this next set of laborers and the third hour, we read that he sees them standing idle in the marketplace. They've wasted part of the day idle. No productivity, no fruitfulness in that time. And he says to these, you go into the vineyard too, but notice he doesn't specify how much they're going to be paid. Whatever is right, I will give to you. And then about the, those he calls at the sixth hour and the ninth hour, we read in verse 5 that he did the same for them. There was no contract, no specific agreement. It was just whatever is right, the master is going to give to them. Now notice all of these have wasted different portions of their time, different portions of the day. They've given away and have not engaged in fruitfulness in these times. But now... They're going into the vineyard, and they're just going trusting their master. It's a terrible negotiation strategy to just have your employer set your payment. You really should have a conversation about that. This is a terrible way to go about this, unless you really, really, really trust the employer. Now, I want to just mention that these are neither the first to go into the labor in the field, and they are not the last. There's sort of this middle group. And as such, they really don't come up much anymore at all. We don't really hear from them, don't hear about them too much, except uh, kind of vaguely when they are paid at the end of the day. Uh, but we don't hear about them at all. They're not in view of this. We read rather about the first laborers, and when we get to verses 6 through 7, we come to the second group who's in view here, the last laborers. In verse 6, we read about the 11th hour. Now, now this is about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. It's at the end of the day. So, so we have, you know, today is the, the great celebration of daylight savings time, right? When we're uh, suddenly six o'clock is going to look very different than six o'clock looked yesterday, right? Like, because we live in a place where uh, the, the sun rises and sets. And for some reason, I don't understand, we change our clock to go with it or to change. I don't know. But the point is, we live in a place where that's changing. In a lot of places in the world, right around the equator, um, it doesn't change. Um, I remember when I, when I was in Colombia visiting and was talking with one of the Colombians, I was explaining how sometimes the sun sets after nine o'clock at night. And he says, I literally could not imagine what that would be like. <laughs> Other places in the world, the sun rises at 6 a.m. That's why the day started there. And it sets at 6 p.m. And so at 5 p.m., there's very little daylight left to burn, very little uh, daylight left to go out in the field. And yet here we find the master going out to hire still more laborers at the 11th hour. He went out, and he found others standing, and he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? 
There's a tragedy to this. There have been lots of other groups, lots of other opportunities to be called and sent out into the field, and these 11th hour, these last labors have not been working at all. Their entire day is a waste. We have here, of course, a picture. There are different ways to look at this, but one of these has to include a picture of a life. A life that has been spent idle, maybe doing many different things, but not doing the kind of fruitful, productive work in the vineyard that God calls His people to do. But at this 11th hour, there's no time to waste. And so in in verse 7, He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. Notice here, there's not even a promise of payment whatsoever. There's just, you're wasting your time, you're idle. You go into the vineyard too. The first group had a contract. The middle group, hired at the third and the sixth and the ninth hour, they had a promise that whatever is right, they will be paid. This last group has nothing that they are promised. They are just told to go work. Now, who are these people? Who were the first? Well, we have probably an idea of who the first might be. Jesus has been talking about them, interacting with them. But who then are these last? Well, the people who are last answer this question. They say, no one has hired us. These last laborers are what um, one commentator, Hagner, describes as those who are undesirable by others. They have not been called because these are the last people you would think to give this kind of a responsibility to. And in the wider Gospel of Matthew, we're told that stereotypical last refer to the tax collectors and to the prostitutes. For example, in the next chapter, in Matthew 21, verse 31, there's a really important thing that Jesus says. He says to the Pharisees, those who are first in that society, he says, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. The last are made first in what Jesus is saying there. And that's what this whole parable is getting at in the labors, in the the, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard that the last are elevated in a particular way where they are made to be first, even though they have wasted so much of their life idle, even though they have no particular promise that they are clinging to in this particular parable, they willingly go out into the field. Why? Because someone has finally called them. Someone has finally put them to work, and they are eager to get to work. Now, why are the eagerness here, especially when they don't know what they're going to make out of this? Well, have you ever been the last one picked? Again, highly decorated but not victorious athlete here speaking. If you're ever in these lines where they're picking different people and you have two captains and they're picking people for their team, I have been in that last group of two people. Either they're going to pick me or they're going to pick whoever that other poor kid is. Let me tell you, when you're in that position, it makes all the difference in the world. And I I remember some of these cases where someone said, we want Jacob. Now they were just being kind, Uh, but they would said that they wanted me, right? They, They chose me. And I will tell you, I was willing to run through a wall for that team because I was glad to be picked. Because the only other alternative at that point was for someone to say, this also happened. Do we have to take either of them? I don't want either of them. And that's a horrible position to be in. At least if you're the very last person, they don't have to say anything and you can just go and put your head down and do your duty and hopefully recess will be over sooner rather than later. When these people who are last are given the dignity and the hope of a particular call, they know that they are desired, that they are wanted, and they are willing to do whatever the master asks them to do. I think some of you probably believe, and maybe you only believe this secretly, but you believe that in a variety of ways for a variety of reasons that you are not wanted, that you are not desired, that you could never be called to something as significant as laboring in the vineyard, and maybe because of those fears, maybe because of things that people have told you, You've spent a substantial portion of your life up to this point idle. Maybe not entirely idle, but certainly more idle than you might have been if you had only understood the call that you have on your life by the master of the vineyard to go out and to serve in the vineyard. Maybe you've constantly felt passed over. No one called me. Well, understand the nature and character of our God. God. 
Do you know that our God loves picking those who are last for his purposes? Picking those who are utterly undesirable by all the ways that the world esteems and evaluates and sizes up people. The Lord does what is foolish, not foolish in reality, but foolish in the eyes of the world. We read in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 28 through 29. I read this last week. I'm going to read it again today because it's important. That God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not. He's talking about people. To bring to nothing things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. The reason God loves choosing those who are last is because they are never under any uncertainty or doubt or confusion that they are the ones making things happen. Jesus chooses the people the world considers most undesirable so that no one can boast, but so that sinners who know they need Jesus may come gladly into his presence. Have you heard the call of Jesus? Do you understand the call he has on you, calling you to follow him and to come serve him? Do you rejoice in the thought that you might be one of these last people that Jesus would pick to serve in his vineyard? Because if not the alternative is to smugly feel that maybe I'm not the last, I'm the first. Well, who are the different? Or how do we know the difference? Who are the first? Who are the last? Well, we come to know something about the last or the first based on their response in this second section, compensating. When the accounts are settled with the master in verses 8 through 12, compensating. In verses 8 and 9, we read in 8 that evening came. Again, it's 6 o'clock. The sun is setting. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. Okay? Seems reasonable enough. Verse 9, and when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now, this is not expected. They worked a partial day. They worked one-twelfth of a full day, and yet they were paid as though they had worked the entire day. This is foolishness in the eyes of the world. Employers, if you run your businesses this way, you will not be in business for very long. They didn't work the full day. They got more than a participation trophy. They got given that first place prize for doing very little work. And this is shocking. Now, again, we don't really read. We just sort of vaguely understand that from the last up to the first, they're going to be paid. So those groups who are hired at the ninth hour and the sixth hour and the third hour, they are also paid. But we don't read anything about them. Instead, we come to the first. What did the first say? Well, in verse 10, now um, he says, now when those hired first, here they are called the first. When those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house. Now, why did they think they should receive more? Well, pridefully, they feel like, well, if those who work, came in last and worked just one hour uh, are given a full denarius, we should receive 12 times what we contracted for. They think they should receive more than their contract had agree been agreed upon. And so they grumble. This language for grumbling, this is the same language for the murmuring among the Israelites in the book of Exodus. Every time the Lord just richly blessed the Israelites, bring them out of Egypt from the Exodus, crossing the Red Sea, uh, they would murmur, we don't have enough water to drink. Every time God would provide water, they would murmur again, we don't have enough food to drink. They're grumbling. Every time God gave them a great gift, they wanted more. That's what's happening here. Whatever they receive, they think they are entitled to more. Why? Well, we're told in verse 12, and on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have Born the burden of the day, they've worked the longest, and the scorching heat, they've worked the hardest under the worst conditions. But remember, and this will come up in the next section, they had a contract. They had an agreement. They knew what they were going to get out of this arrangement, and the master gave them exactly what they bargained for. You ever heard one of those commercials that pop on and saying, if you've been through this or that, if you worked here, or if you were exposed to this, you may be entitled to compensation. I think that line, or at least that ethos, that principle, 
I think that's constantly rolling around in our minds. I should be entitled to some compensation for this. This is just the way we think. Look at what I have done. Look at what I have put up with. Look at the ways that I have faced injustice in my life. I must be entitled to some compensation. How about you? Do you put up with someone who is difficult? Do you think you may be entitled to compensation for that? How many people have put up with you in the course of your life? Or what about burdensome service? Do you think that you have worked hard? How many people have worked for you? How many people were involved in growing and preparing the food that you eat? How many people were involved at what kind of slave wages in stitching together the clothes that you wear? How many people in what kinds of different aspects were involved in building the home that you live on? Do you think you worked hard? Well, how many other people have worked for you? What about the length of your tenure? I've been here the longest. I'm deserving of some respect. But how many people have gone before you? And how many people will come after you? Do you remember this parable that Jesus gave that we looked at several weeks ago in Matthew chapter 18 about the debtor who owed his master 10,000 talents? You remember what happened to him? He pleaded. He said, I can't pay this. Would you forgive this debt? And the master was so gracious and generous that the master forgave everything. And what's the first person that that man does? He goes out to collect the debts that others owe to him. Much smaller debts. He learned nothing from that interaction. The master was willing to forgive him, but he felt entitled to collect from other people. Whatever you think the world owes you, how much do you owe God? How much do you owe to other people? What Jesus is doing in these who are first, whether they truly are first in the ways of the world or whether these are people who just imagine themselves to be first for whatever kinds of things they've gone through, Jesus puts the pride of the first on display here, partially because he wants to humble our me-first hearts, but also to warn us of the consequences of this me-first kind of an attitude. Just as the unforgiving servant was cast out from before the king and put in prison until he should repay everything, so also those who are first here are cast away out of the presence of the master of this house. This comes to the third section, casting away in verses 13 through 16. We read that the master replies in verse 13 to one of them. He says, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Now, this word for friend sounds really nice because it probably shouldn't be translated friend. This word shows up in only two other locations, both of them in the Gospel of Matthew. And one commentator, R.C. Trench, writes that this is a word of evil omen. When this word drops, you know that something bad is about to happen. The next time this word comes up is in Matthew 22, verse 12, the parable of the, the wedding banquet. When there's this great wedding banquet and the master invites those first who he intends to come, and what do they do? They don't have time for that. They're not interested in going to that particular banquet. So the master then has to call all these other people who are called last, and they come into his presence, and it's a wonderful banquet until the master comes upon someone who is not prepared. He's wearing no wedding garment. And here's what he says. He says, friend, same word, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? What happens to him? He's bound up and carried out of the wedding feast and cast out into the outer darkness. The third time this word appears is the worst of all. It's on the lips of Jesus, spoken to Judas in Matthew 26, verse 50, when Judas comes to betray him. And Jesus says, friend, do what you came to do. The word here is a very strong word of warning and condemnation. And this master says to the leader of this pack, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Why? because he paid him exactly what he owed him. The man, these men asked for a denarius, and they were given a denarius. The contract was paid in full. But do you remember earlier in the Gospel of Matthew when Jesus says, if you give to the poor, do it in secret? If you pray, pray in secret, because otherwise if you're doing it in front of all of these people, I tell you the truth, they have their reward in full. The first, those who parade their achievements and their accomplishments, they will have their reward in full. And that's exactly what these people have. They have their reward in full. And so in verse 14, the master says, take what belongs to you 
and go. That word for go, as one commentator points out, is the exact same word that Jesus spoke to Satan earlier during the temptation in Matthew 4, verse 10. Be gone, Satan. Take what belongs to you and be gone. Those who were first, those who had it all together, those who expected to receive the most, those who had negotiated, are now cast out of the presence of this master. They will not be rehired the next day. Now, why were they cast away? Well, it was their prideful entitlement. But it's particularly how this prideful entitlement made them think about other people. Notice in verse 14, the master not only says, take what belongs to you and go, but then he says, I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do, verse 15, what I choose with what belongs to me? And then he says this, or do you begrudge my generosity? That's, if you have the ESV, that's what we have here. If you have another translation, you might get a little bit more literal here. It's, or is your eye evil because I am good? Is your eye evil because I am good is what the master says. Now what they are saying here, what he's saying here is they're actually judging the master because of his goodness, because of his generosity. The problem is not what they didn't get from the master. The problem is what the master gave to the other people. Do you remember what they said in verse 12? It wasn't so much what the master gave to them. They had no problem. Oh, they're getting a denarius? Great. Why? Because they thought that they would then receive um, a proportionately more. The problem they had in verse 12 was that you made these equal with us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. The problem was with that this master made those who are last equal with the first. But Jesus says that's not actually what he does. And so in verse 16, he says, the last will be the first, and the first last. The point is that the last will be promoted in spite of any protests that come from the first. Now, how are we to embrace this? How are we to apply this? Well, application, I think, that arises from this parable is a warning. We need to embrace being last. Embrace being last. Why? Well, because Jesus says those who are first will be last. And here he says that the last will be made first. The great obstacle to being last is, of course, our me first pride. We don't want to be last. We don't want to be last at the line in the DMV. We don't want to be last in the line for the fellowship meal. We don't want to be last because who knows what's going to be picked over by that time. Who knows if we're going to get what we want out of it. Pride says, I should go first. Pride says, promote me because of me. Because of a sense of all that I have done, bearing the burden of the day in the scorching heat. And if I have done all of this to make myself first, then it isn't fair at all that others should be equal with me. It's actually interesting. Why do we despise participation ribbons? Now, it is true, and this is what I highlighted earlier, that participation trophies and ribbons and things actually harm those who receive them because it teaches them to just sort of settle for idleness that leads to mediocrity and that kind of a thing. But the concern is not that people will necessarily maybe left in that position, never learn to work hard for the sake of the kingdom for its own reward. The concern is why should those people be made equal with others? If others have made themselves first, I don't want them to be made equal with me. How is your heart in all that? Does your heart seek to be first? Maybe you don't mind if someone gets a proportionate amount of their fair share, but can't stand an idea that God would generously, lavishly bless them when you have earned everything that you have. But have you? This is what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus gives a stern warning to the first that he makes the first last. If you are believing that what you have done has earned you anything in the sight of God, you will have your reward in full. And whatever you strike a bargain for will never be enough. Whatever you think you are working for to get, whenever you reach it, you will always want more. 
R.C.H. Lenski points out in this passage, he says, Judas too thought that he ought to get more out of Jesus, and he got it. First, stolen money. We're told that Judas regularly helped himself to the treasurer's bag along the way. And then later, 30 pieces of silver. Jesus or Judas always wanted more from his associated with Jesus, and he got his reward in full. If that's the way you live, though, the warning here is at the end of time, you will hear this terrible word of condemnation. Friend, be gone. That's the warning here. And the question is, is whatever you are chasing right now, is that going to be enough on that last day? If that is your reward in full, will that be enough for you for all eternity into the future? But the gospel announces that while the first will be made last, The last will be made first. And again, this is the first thing that Jesus highlights at the end of this parable. The intentionality here is to highlight the fact that those who are last will indeed be promoted, not because of anything that they have done, but because of the generosity and goodness of Jesus. To embrace being last really puts us in an awkward position, though. It's really hard. It requires us to entrust ourselves, in the words of 1 Peter, to the one who judges justly. That's what Jesus did, and we can understand that. Jesus really was sinless. For him to entrust himself to the one who judges justly means that he knew that he was going to be vindicated in the end, especially by the resurrection. But what about you? Are you willing to entrust yourself to the one who judges justly? That's a little bit like a criminal entrusting himself to a police officer to judge him justly according to the law. Well, if you know those stories, sometimes criminals do entrust themselves to the police in the hopes they'll get some leniency for their cooperation, some kind of a plea deal. But Jesus offers us far more than this, not just a plea deal. Jesus promises radical generosity to those who entrust themselves to Jesus. He will make even those who are last, even those who are entirely behind the eight ball, even those who are entirely guilty, and worthy of God's wrath and condemnation, Jesus says he will make them to be first, not because of what they have done, but because of what Jesus did for us. Which means that it is far better to entrust yourself to God's promises than to your performance. The heart of the last, and that's what we have to embrace, is to keep perpetually in our minds to know absolutely that we have wasted our lives as idols. Some of you have come to Christ later in life. Some of you may not have come to Christ already yet this morning. And so you look back on your lives and you see wreckage in the past of all those years when you may have been faithful and fruitful in the vineyards of our Lord. But even those of you who have followed the Lord all your lives, you can look back on so many cases. I never knew a day where I didn't know Jesus. I look back on so many places in my own life where I was idle, and not only idle, I was causing mischief in the Lord's vineyard. And to understand that I justly deserve God's wrath and displeasure, I am not the good kid who deserves something. I am the least. I am the last. I am owed nothing by God. So that we have no hope in this world apart from God's sovereign mercy. Now some of you keenly know this. You are keenly aware of your status as last in the world. And I want to hold out to you exactly what we just read. Run to the promises of Jesus. Do you hear his heart to elevate, to promote, to bless, to call those who are last in the world, those whom nobody else wants? It's a shocking, scandalous gospel that cuts against the wisdom of the world. But Jesus nevertheless calls, you go into the vineyard too. Which means that you must put away everything that you have been and have done, whether you think it's good or bad, put it all behind you. Turn from it. And turn to Jesus to embrace him for what he offers you. What this means is that you will no longer be what you once were. It means that you will become valued servants of the king who are forgiven because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, who are made righteous as he gifts his righteousness to us and who are cleansed from all of our pollutions by his sprinkled blood. That's the promise that Jesus offers in the gospel. But for others, you may not intuitively realize that you were the last. You may not intuitively know that you're not owed something. 
You may need to set aside your pride to recognize that you are indeed not the first, but you are indeed guilty. Do you know the riches of God's kindness to those who come humbly? Do you know that at the end of time when you stand before the throne dressed in beauty, not your own, to see God as He is, to love Him with unsinning heart, do you know then how foolish your claims will feel in eternity to come? How worthless those rags will feel to cast them off? Do you know how lavishly good God's promises are to you in Jesus Christ? Oh, sinners, whether you were the first or the last, put behind it all and come to Jesus. Come to Jesus, embracing being the one who is last, being the least in his kingdom so that he might exalt you and not you trying to exalt yourself. For the last will be first and the first last. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, our pride so often gets in the way of our hearts and we are so powerless to tame it. We can manage so many aspects of our external behavior and yet we cannot tame the pride of our hearts. We need Jesus, the great physician, to do surgery in our hearts that we could never do for ourselves. And so I pray, Father, that your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, would indeed, by the power of his Holy Spirit, cut away our pride, put it to death, so that we might lift our eyes to the heavenly places where Jesus is seated at your right hand. And while we recognize that we have no claim upon him, to also graciously recognize that he has given himself to us lavishly, freely and fully that we might be made his children, your children, Father. And so we pray that you would give faith to any who don't have it yet today to trust in Jesus Christ for salvation or to strengthen the faith of those who are feeling discouraged and despondent in this world. We pray that you would cut down the pride of those who are first and that together we would all take the last position, taking up our cross and following you not to be served, but like the Son of Man, to become a servant of all. I pray this for all those who are here. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.